Uh, my name is Bjarne Marlandsson. I'm an investigative journalist for the Stunde newspaper in Iceland, and I have been doing um, environmental um, investigations now for the past two years. And um, before that, I was actually in in the uh, recycling industry for almost ten years as a consultant, and um, mainly focused on uh, recycling, refurbishing of electronics. So I have some experience. Uh, with this industry uh, before it actually became uh, popular to be green. Um, but I also know how the industry works. And the main theme here is money. That's, that's the only why, way this industry works and the only reason why it is uh, still working. Um, but uh, through our investigation at Stunten, we have found out that this industry does whatever they want to uh, just with profits. This is the only also thing they they want. They have no in, no incentives other than finance to try to do the correct thing. Um, when you take that incentive away, um, that they should be doing the, the the money and just do the right thing, they're not doing it. Um, so, and I was listening now uh, in the last thirty minutes of people speaking about recycling and everything, and how the plastic industry has been advertising the the recycling of plastics for the past 40, 50 years. Well, we're still on the 21st century in the year 2022, and the industry has still no idea how to recycle most of the plastics. Um, it's simply one of the biggest scams ever done regarding a product, which is the recycling of plastics and how they are trying to convince you that this is easily recyclable, uh, that multi-billion companies are actually doing it, and they're trying to uh, fix the situation and you should be feeling okay by using your plastic product. Uh, this is just a sham. Um, um, every, every company that I've been investigating here in Iceland, we have found out that actually has some kind of a problem. And even, even um, um, institutions of the Icelandic government also have a problem inside them and are co cooperating with the companies to scam um, um, people who are collecting, sorting, and even cleaning the plastics. Uh, and we, we went to a warehouse um, in the December of last year in Porit in Sweden, in the south of Sweden, where we found uh, over 3,000 tons of mixed plastics from households, uh, which the, the government of Iceland has actually paid for a lot of this plastic to be recycled, over 100 million Icelandic kronas. It's believed that up to 1,500 tons of these 3,000 to 3,500 tons, which are in the warehouse, uh, came from Iceland. So the Icelandic recycling companies actually received 100 million Icelandic kronas to ship it to Sweden, to a company called Sverek, uh, that was supposed to recycle it. But the problem is they never did. Um, they actually just put them in their uh, lot and then they, they moved it from one container to another container and they transported it to this facility in Porit. Uh, this is a 15,000 square meter um, uh, warehouse with um, up to eight meters high. Um, so a lot of plastic could be have, uh, was actually in there. So this was done in 2016. And uh, the, actually the Icelandic Recycling Fund who paid the Icelandic companies 100 million Icelandic kronos knew about this problem uh, back in 2020, uh, in July of 2020. So, and they did not nothing. Uh, we have communications which we asked uh, for that the CEO of the Icelandic Recycling Fund knew that their plastic that they paid to be recycled is in the warehouse, but not only did they pay, they also put it in their statistics that they shipped then to the Icelandic EPA and said that, oh yeah, all these 500 tons recycled. Nothing, nothing to com uh, com complain from there. And we're doing a fantastic job here. So the, the system works, the industry works and everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. Um, and, and according to our research and what we published, that, that is a scam. Um, actually, the, um, the chairman of the Icelandic Recycling Fund and two other members of the board actually resigned after we start publishing. And the problem we have here is that 
we always hear, and I have heard this that in, in many lectures I had and in many discussions, is that we, this should be a cooperation between the industry and the government. The problem is, is that the industry is leading this, this conversation. The government is just following. So, um, for example, in the Icelandic Recycling Fund, we have seven members in the board. Four of them actually come from the, the industry. Three of them come from the government. So whatever the industry says that they want to do, they do it through the board of a fund which is regulated and owned by the Icelandic government and is paid by taxpayers' money. So their incentive inside the Icelandic Recycling Fund, for example, for plastics, is to keep the recycling fee or the, 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 the corporate responsibility fee as low as they can. So because they don't want to pay too much for the packaging and everything that they produce. So the incentive for them is to keep it low, but that puts pressure on the recycling companies because they also have to make money. So what do they do? Yes, they cut corners. And they actually brought the services of Sverek in Sweden, which is the cheapest company you can find to ship plastic to. And to, to give you a little bit of a sample of how Sverek has been working for the past six years, they have actually been in, under police investigations in three countries. They had to pay millions of euros in fines, both in Norway and Sweden. And they actually shipped over 25,000 tons of plastic to Lithuania, which got burned in an open field. So, and, and they actually, the, the, the Lithuanian military had to be called to, to, to shut that down. So it, in these seminars I have been taking part of is that I always hear this hope that by banning single use plastics or this type of plastic, or we can put this regulation in and the government is for it. No, this is con all, the, all the investigations we have done and through all the emails we have access to, it's always the industry which is leading the way in this issue. So, for example, uh, when the ban now for single-use plastics was actually put through and, and many environmental groups, uh, they looked at it as a victory. Well, it, it didn't, didn't matter for the plastic industry because what you've seen is that even after the ban, the influx of money and investment in new plastic facilities or, or plastic factories, basically, is skyrocketing. You've never seen as much investment in new plastic uh, um, 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 facilities as, as for now. They're actually building the biggest plastic manufacturing plant in Texas right now. So the industry knows that we're seeing an influx in money of investment in plastic production. But somehow the government is telling us, yes, we're fighting plastics. These things don't add up because there is nothing to add up here. And you can even see it how inside the Ministry of Environment here in Iceland, how they always talk to the industry and how the industry is leading this by saying, oh, yeah, we'll be doing by 20, you know, for example, there was one promise by Coca-Cola that they would actually be using more uh, recycled plastic in their bottles. That promise was supposed to be held in 2016. They broke that promise. They promised it again in 2020. Well, they kept it for some, but not all. And now they're promising it again in by 2030. So these promises have no, there's no legal binding with these promises. But what we can see with good laws and regulations, and by banning bigger parts of plastic, you will actually see reduction of plastic in the industry. Because by, tax, by putting tax, extra tax on these single use consumer products that for decades was made from glass, metal or, or, or paper, which is now being manufactured with plastics. If you put an extra tax on that plastic, you can see a decrease in the investment of that product. And you can see then the paper, the metal and the, the glass coming back in. But then we also have a problem there because the recycling industry has failed in every level. You can probably see paper is doing the best way, but there's so many fields here that they are just collapsing uh, uh, in, in any, any matter which you, which you research. And the, the astonishing thing that I have, I've been in now in, in, in environmental journalism for the past four years, it, it has not mattered if I 
every time I've looked, I've found shit. It doesn't matter. If, if, wherever ever I put a, a shovel down and start my research, I found something was wrong. And it seems that there's no legislation, for example, here in Iceland and many other countries that does absolutely nothing to these companies. They can continue this forever. The only thing they're mostly scared of is not the government, is, is PR, bad PR. And that should not be something that we could actually um, have in a, in, a, in a legal society where we should have rules. And if you bro break these rules, uh, for example, polluting the, the, the environment, you should have be punished. But we don't have that in, in Iceland and many other countries. But it's, optimism is also always good, but optimism can also lead to tragic disasters. And we have been seeing this in the recycling industry for the, of plastics for the past 40 years. And when you cannot even trust a recycling company from Sweden, we're not talking about somebody from Russia or North Korea or, or, or Iran. We're talking about a recycling company from Sweden with all the, all the regulations. They were, the Swedish government said they have all the stamps, all the licenses, and they're doing absolutely correct. But still, for some reason, for six years, they've been um, um, breaking the law. They've been under police investigations. They have been, you know, basically uh, grabbed doing things that they should not be doing. And again, they just continue business all, all over again. So the, the, I think the optimism is good, but I think strong regulations is the only thing you can actually do to stop uh, this pollution. And, um, you know, the, the, the warehouse in Porit in, in South Sweden is just a tip of the iceberg because that's what you, we can find out with a little bit of a research. And, and, and to see that they are selling you as a consumer the idea, well, don't feel bad about this plastic container that we put around your product, which is only single use, um, because you can recycle it. But most of the time, and I'm not saying not in, in over 90% of the case, it's bullshit. And even you can see this, how the plastic is, is marked with the numbers one to seven. Um, the industry somehow managed to talk to the governments that this should be a legal definition of, they should put these stamps on from the numbers one to seven. You've seen these uh, rotating circles, uh, um, um, uh, not circles, sometimes circles, but mostly it's pyramids and the number inside. But most of this plastic will never be recycled. Mm -hmm. Only three categories are actually recycled today, and one of them is quite difficult to recycle, but the rest is completely unrecyclable. And for example, the category seven, th that's, that's, not one ca that's not one type of plastic. There's over 10 or 15,000 types of plastics we have in that category. So no plastic uh, recycling company is recycling this product. They can burn it, they can, you know, downcycle it or whatever, but it's not recycling. Um, and it's, it's difficult to see how we're going to, how we're doing now in 2022 is that we're basing on the same spot we were doing in 1980, which is we're making a huge amount of product that causes a huge amount of environmental impact and we're not dealing with it because the industry has no intention of doing this. And you can see this in their PR that they're actually picking up the same thing that the cigarette industry did for years, is that they're always stalling for time. It's always, oh yeah, there is a technology coming out just you know, in, in few years, we will have this under control. But at, until then, the, the governments of all these countries that are using this plastic, for example, here in Iceland, the uh, Icelandic government is paying for these, the waste of these, the, which these companies are making. And, uh, and then the, there's no oversight, as our research has shown. There is a little, little um, you know, in, in many cases, people don't resign, except this is actually the first case uh, where the three board members of the Icelandic um, recycling fund resigned because of our writings, but it's 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 so much more, and we have endless of 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 cases now which we're working we're working actually on currently on forty cases, and and that stack is just going up, and not even the Icelandic EPA has the funding 
to research everything and make sure that everything is done correctly. Because you even have governmental institutions like the Icelandic Recycling Fund, which is basically falsifying documents, which is falsifying data. And how can you fight a problem if you cannot examine the problem correctly? So it's, it's, it's a difficult road that we have. And I, I heard also about a few people who are talking about uh, the bioplastics. Well, good luck with that, because there is absolutely, um, and excuse my uh, French here, it's just horseshit, because this is a compound which will be blended with other plastics. You cannot compost this like any other material that is compostable, and it creates a huge problem in the waste uh, management industry. So it's, it's, again, we are doing the same thing. We're trying to make us feel better about our consumption. And that's what the companies make money on, that consume as much as you can and just feel good about it, you know, because we will take care of the problem when you have finished with, you know, the container you had your fruit salad in or, or your avocado toast. It, but that, that's, that's the problem we have here, is that it's just an illusion. We don't have a have a, a good solution for this, and and that should actually be in the legislation that you cannot put out a product and produce it until you have a way to either upcycle it or recycle it or somehow reuse it, and that and this is something that we were doing in the 50s and 60s um, in the milk industry. We were using glass. The the, the Coca Cola company was using bottles again over and over. Beer and everything were cleaning this. But the plastic industry managed to destroy that industry and put in a really cheap and effective plastic bottles, which you can make then huge bottling plants um, and somewhere in, in, in Europe or in the US, where you can then distribute from that main point instead of have many bottling plants. So again, it's, it's a huge, uh, I, I don't think even the 30 minutes I have here to speak is enough, but um, um, the, the, the the case which we have here is that you're not the first students who are in waste management or dealing with this plastic problem. There were students going over this in the 1980s, 1990s, and they are basically asking the same questions at that time that you are asking right now. So if you just look at any other industry, computer industry, car industry, all of these industries has managed to move away. Uh, the car industry is moving to electric. Uh, you know, the computer industry is just always moving to solve the next problem. But somehow this industry just is the same problem we have now in 2022 as we have in 1980. But um, if you have any questions, uh, since this is a big case, um, I'll just keep that open here if, you have any, if there are any Q and A's. Thank you so much for this devastating talk. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry to, to be, uh, no, you know, a party please, here, but I'm really just pointing needed. out the facts here. This was brilliant, but <laughs> but it was also so, I, I was always asking, why, why don't you have like even your beer in recyclable bottles? Every other, I don't know. <laughs> and, and everything is in cans and plastic bottles, right? Why don't we have, we, why can't we wash our bottles? So really, yeah, okay, that was the um, industry, okay. Yeah, we did that for Thank decades. Yeah. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to invent the wheel here, but it's, it's, it's cost-effective to put it in plastic. Yeah, and you had it's it. Only before. about the money. I didn't know it was there before. I thought it just didn't ever reach Iceland, except no. for the milk bottles. I have heard about that, but okay, no, I, yeah. I mean, the Coca-Cola company did this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Pepsi, everybody had glass. There was there was no plastic. Stacy has her hand up. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, hi. I enjoy this every time because, okay, it seems like there's a lack lack of transparency. Oh and, yeah. Uh, as well as okay, we have great laws, but the implementation monitoring is not being performed. Uh, well, I, I, I will just stop you there a little bit. I have to disagree that we have great laws because these laws are actually written uh, by many companies. For example, the law now that we are passing in Iceland on the 1st of January 2023, which is actually a European regulation, um, we decided to translate it incorrectly 
so the fishing industry can get a, out of a corporate responsibility. Shocking. So, I mean, I mean, oh, uh, we crazy. have documentations of this, and and the EPA does nothing. The you know the Ministry of Environment does nothing, and the Ministry itself doesn't do nothing. So it's a yeah, cozy so relationship between the industry and the the EPA. So who holds them accountable? Both the Nobody. government and the yeah. It's, How can we find a solution for that? It's because only done by. It's only done by the parliament. It's only do done by regulations and laws, because there's no other way around it. it. Because it needs to also be strict. Because you can see, you know, in the laws and regulation what you should do, but there's no, you know, prison term or there's no, you know, there are no big fines for doing something wrong here. And in this case with the warehouse, they actually sent, and I'm, I'm, I'm not joking here. They sent an Icelandic delegation to investigate the warehouse in Sweden and the plastic after we did the story in December. They actually sent out the, 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 the individuals who were the CEOs of these recycling companies who did the scam in the first place and they were researching themselves. That's, and they put out a statement where they said, no, nope, there's nothing to see here. It's only a really small amount of plastics. And they stayed in the warehouse for 20 minutes. And this was sent to the Icelandic parliament and the Ministry of Environment and case closed. Hmm. The plastic is still there and we're not going to pick it up. No independent investigation. Yeah, no, nothing, none, none, none. So whatever. And and uh, Jen, we are actually publishing a story uh, to answer this next week. And the, the, the holes in the statement which they made after their, investig their investigation, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you, you could not have a boat with these holes. It would sink quite, quite fast. Are we not part of the problem? Because we as citizens are not really demanding more from the well, government. Yeah, we, 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 we demand the laws. But the you know how the how the laws then are are, are put in, into effect. The industry has put themselves everywhere in the system to stop the implementation, and you can see this definitely by the Icelandic Recycling Fund. They have over two billion Icelandic kroners every year, and it's controlled not by you know uh, the members of the EPA or some environmental groups, or even groups from consumers. No, it's controlled by the industry itself. So it's, 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 it's not only about the law, it's about the, how the laws will actually then put in effect. For example, with the Icelandic Recycling Fund. And you have these, um, these corporate responsibility programs like the Icelandic Recycling Fund, you have them all over Europe. But the difference here is that in, for example, in Norway and Sweden, they are privately owned by the biggest plastic manufacturers in these countries. So they're self-regulating themselves. So it's, it, it, and they're just happy with it. Yeah, they, of, <laughs> of course they say what they want to do and then they will do it. <laughs> yeah, but they don't, they, it's, it's greenwash. And they've been doing it for years. We, we're also coming out of a story next week where the bottle recycling company in Iceland, and they actually have the, they're the only company in Iceland who are allowed by law to recycle bottles, uh, uh, plastic bottles, cans and glass. And they actually put advertisements out that what will happen to a glass bottle? It will be recycled into another glass bottle but they haven't recycled one single bottle in 33 years. Yeah, well, Still, I mean, they're advertising this. What are they doing with the glass? I have heard different myths about that. Oh, yeah. No, they're just trashing it. It yeah, goes I, to the dump. Yeah, just, don't, don't, they pulverize, sorry. don't they pulverize it and just send it to the, the landfill with the other waste? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Save space. And then all the plastic stickers on it goes with it. All the metal inside, you know, with the with the wine bottles and everything, it goes with it. Even though it's illegal in Iceland to put metal in these landfills, okay. they don't even have to put a magnet over the glass just to pick up the metals. They just shamelessly throw it away. 
Sæll Bjartmar, uh, Giorgio heit ég, ég er heimspeki kennari hérna á Akureyri. Sæll. And uh, well, uh, I feel like uh, we've uh, run in a big circle because I started today uh, by uh, outlining the fundamental value opposition between a system that is run on money for money and uh, other values including the health of people, societies, species, and ecosystems. And uh, the, the, the business model we have in place can't really grasp, can't even begin to conceive of reality in terms of health uh, and uh, future generations and uh, 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 environmental issues. But um, I found myself in total agreement with you and the way you depict uh, today's reality, and also the relationship between uh, the lawmaking process and uh, the cloud of the vested interests. So I really had to work hard to find uh, something, you know, I might be slightly in disagreement uh, with in order to uh, have an interesting discussion with you. And I was thinking when you uh, stated that uh, we want uh, uh, better laws. And I thought, well, um, not even in Germany, after the massive floods last year, the Green Party, that historically in Germany has been uh, quite a, a power, managed to secure a majority in Parliament. So if I look around Europe, originally I am from Italy and my wife is Scottish. You know. If I look around Europe, which is regarded as uh, being at the forefront of uh, environmental uh, issues in the world, uh, perhaps only after Costa Rica, uh, there hasn't been a case of a Green Party over an ecological movement or even just a, 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 an environmentalist platform of some kind being uh, the driving force and becoming the leading power in politics. Yeah, because you have no money. Yeah, but you know, it looks like voters still are interested in either paying uh, lower taxes or keeping uh, refugees and immigrants outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, C could that be in part because we still see environmental issues as a so-called special issue rather than something that we need to massively solidify all of these other satellite issues around? I think. <laughs> yeah. It's becoming a real discussion here, mm -hmm. but you can't see our faces, so it must be quite alienating yeah, you for you. <laughs> I, I think I think what's happening here is that we actually have a Green Party in the Iceland government, and we had a minister. Yeah, but it's not the leading force. <laughs> no, but they actually had the prime minister, and and the last last um, um, government actually had the minister of the left Green Party as the env in my environmental minister. And his former job was a CEO of actually environmental, the biggest environmental group in Iceland. Still, he could not put in effect any regulations or laws that needed to tell the industry to behave just like normal human beings. <laughs> and that, 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 if, if that cannot establish something that if a green, left green party with the ministry itself, cannot put strong regulations, and you can still see the industry somehow managing to put their writings in the laws and the regulations for their benefit, not for the environmental benefit or even the taxpayer benefit, because we are paying for this in the end, is that then we lose, then we have lost hope on the old Green Party agendas. I think what we need to see this is that this, this this has nothing to do with politics this is to, something to do with economics and also mathematics uh, because there's only x much of amount of plastic that we can actually tolerate as an uh, uh, as a planet until it starts to have an effect on major industries for example water industry or fishing industry and many other industries so the, the economics are even bad. So even right-wing parties should have environmental issues at the forefront because it will affect the total cost of running the, 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 running the country 
And even they have to, in, in a few years, they will have to put plastic filters in every damn, you know, um, um, a faucet in the country because well, but, we will have this, all this plastic coming into the groundwater. So, but it, it isn't the problem though. I mean, our economic system is based around, you know, short term gains and, you know, the exactly, externalities yeah. are a long term problem. And even the problem that you're talking about, needing a goddamn filter to filter out microplastics, I mean, mm-hmm. hey, that's just an opportunity to make more fucking, I'm sorry, to make more money. You know, that's true. I mean, so I, I guess what I would like to ask is, I mean, is what really seems to be missing here to, to kind of frame this in a little bit more concrete terms, what's missing is not so much laws, but laws with teeth. We, we don't have the mechanism enforcements or interest in even putting those enforcement mechanisms into place. So how do we as a population get to a point where, you know, we can say, listen, politicians, where's the regulatory mechanism? Where is it? Where's the accountability and where's the oversight? How do we make that happen? I think you have Shaming. to. Shaming. Yeah. That's the only thing you can do uh, on uh, um, in the 21st century on social media, basically making fun of them, shaming them into doing the right thing. That it, it seems to have worked with our writings. Um, you know, politicians are actually, I have been asking now the Ministry of Environment since 9th of December for an interview. And still he hasn't replied. I have been asking the chairman of the Iceland Recycling Fund for the interview since the 15th of December. He hasn't still replied. The only thing is that he couldn't actually be bothered to come <laughs> and talk to us at Stunti. So could, could I maybe push back? I mean, maybe I would actually say your statements are actually evidence that, you know, maybe shaming them into compliance isn't working. I mean, like if we look at, you know, Nazi Germany in the lead up to, you know, World War II, I mean, you know, you had the academics and the satirists and the columnists writing, you know, piece after piece in the in the media, and and what happened? I mean, we still well, yeah, maybe maybe in in Iceland it actually works because we are a reputation based society a lot. So when when you lose your reputation for not doing a good work, um, it, it actually affects you more than you believe in a bigger society like the U.S. or Italy or Germany. Here, actually, we have a really good reputation-based system that people actually can be made of laughing stock and uh, shamed into doing the right thing. So, I, you know, just for Iceland, it actually is a little bit working. Uh, they are actually, as I said, three members of the Iceland Recycling Fund resigned uh, over this matter. And now the pressure is on the Ministry of Environment to actually do the right thing. So. Uh, I, I, I don't think we ever seen for the past 30 years in Iceland such uh, a move done that you're seeing members being, re- they are resigning, that the Ministry of Environment is running away from the media instead of running towards them and always asking for an interview because this ministry is not really a big thing in Iceland. So something is happening right now. We're at, at the turning point, I think, where we can see that you cannot be a politician or have a political party unless you have a reasonable environmental policy. So that's a huge difference from just 2015 or 2010. So this is, I think this is gradually changing and will change fast, hopefully. And that's the only way we will actually get out of this problem. Not by the industry, not by technology. This will not be solved that way. This, is only be, this will only be solved by a lot of regulations and laws. Yeah, I think another thing where we have to um, uh, set a lever is with the uh, individual people being actually interested in this, because if the individual people don't care, it's like, okay, my plastic is in, in, in Sweden, who cares? If, if this, is, this is the case, then there is no pressure on the politicians. So we need to find things that people actually care about. And many people are just just care about how comfortable it is to sit on the sofa in the evening. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> yeah, well, they actually we, do. We need, Here's the we thing. need people to care about this and not just because of reputation. It needs to be painful for the individual. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that is also a lot through the media. Um, and we start feeling the health consequences. So I think there is a lot of research that needs to go out to the people so they realize actually what what they, the effects they feel actually come from their own ignorance. So I think there are yeah. some things we, we can still bring out to the people. But also I think the, the people normally, you know, it's a normal thought that, okay, now what are they gonna change if I just 
you know, talk about this with my colleagues, or if I post this, or if I go to the town hall and try to talk with someone about it. They don't believe in the power that that citizenship has when they are together. So I think that's the most important point, because of course, when you're talking individually with the people, it's like, no, uh, you know, I, I see this ocean, pl plenty of plastic, and I was like super sad about it. I saw this bird trapping in the plastic and wow, was such a thing and so on. But then later, they, they don't think that they have the power to change that. No, because they saw a cat video next to that video. Yeah, exactly. Because the next you, you can distract <laughs> yourself easily. I think there is a lot of psychology behind this question. But Jeremy has another question: like, yeah. how can we flip the costs of plastic? So like, plastic should be more expensive than paper. How can we do that? I have really no idea. Really easy. Really easy. You have to. There's actually a sentence in the law on how much of a recycling fee plastic has. Change it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the only thing you need to do. By law. Mm -hmm. By law. So when an importer or a manufacturer of plastic, plastic is producing plastic, they have to pay this fee, this tax to the government. So they will think, oh, shit, OK. I mean, it's 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 much cheaper to make this from paper. So I'm going to try to minimize as much using plastics. And, and that's a, it's a simple line in the law that has a number and you just need to change that number. Mm -hmm. And that's it, that's, then it's done. Taxes. Okay. Taxes. That, I mean, that, that, that's the only way to get out of it because to try that, I've, I've always been asking politicians, you know, what, you know you're all for the environment and everybody is in, in the campaigns, they love the environment and they say it's really important. Mm. But when you ask about this number, because just to raise it a little bit, no. Because there's too much money at stake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. and even the paper industry, the aluminum industry, and the glass industry all combined cannot fight against the plastic industry. And when when you say that that you feel sorry for Alcoa, <laughs> then then you then you're at a, at a pretty pretty bad place. Yeah. So it's sorry. it's. It's always funny to see that how and who they can beat. They can not only beat the politicians, they can also beat international huge companies. Yeah. I think so. Do you mean taxing the companies or the consumer? Because oh, no, you need to. That's the thing. You need to tax the product itself. So when I'm producing, for example, just I don't know, um, a, a mouse pad, uh, that the packaging around the mouse pad, because plastic is so cheap, that's the first choice I will pick today. But if there was a tax on that plastic as a company being able to pay it, that it would actually be economically better to put it in paper, then I would pick that choice. Okay. Yeah. And what about banning of exporting of trash? So that the country oh, yeah. deals yeah. with it. That's that's a regulation which actually the European Union is working on, just banning, completely banning it. But the industry has a solution for that. Burn it for energy. So and and they're even putting it here that we need to build a plant that should be burning 100 to 150,000 tons of waste. And if you look at the calculations where they get that 100 to 150,000, it's based on that we will not be recycling more. We will just be, you know, there will be no increase in recycling, no extra fees or, or some marketing plan to get people to recycle more. No, we're just going to burn it. Yeah, we, we, we learned that today. Recycling is not, not the reality. That's just a, a myth. Yeah. I am so sorry, but we are half an hour over our time and we Thank still you, have one talk to go. <laughs> but Not a problem. This uh, was so exciting okay. and I'm definitely um, going to follow on your next articles. And yes, I, I'm we'll sure do. They, we will publish on next Wednesday. So, so check on Stuntin. We will do that. Keep Thank up the good so fight. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.